We're continuing this series that we started a few weeks ago, What Do We Believe? The Baptist Faith and Message. Uh, we're going to read a fairly familiar passage to start today. I bet you don't even have to turn to it, but go ahead and do it just, just because it's not Baptist not to. It is Baptist not to. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Open up your bottle. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> so we've, uh, we've been here for a few weeks, and we're looking at uh, articles 6, 7, and 8 today. We started on Article 1, the beginning of the Baptist faith and message. If you've missed any of this stuff, like all the Baptist faith and message is, is it's a, it's a general declaration of what uh, the Southern Baptist Convention considers to be the most concise and, and important beliefs that we need to put out there. It's not a, it's, this is not everything that's important uh, to a church. It's not all that Scripture says about anything, but it is these certain things, here's where we stand on these things, and here's where we're proud to stand on these things uh, because we believe it's what Scripture says, and that's why it is our doctrine. We do not have to, um, we don't, like there's no, we're not tied to this, but as cooperating churches, cooperating Southern Baptist churches, we all say, you know, this is kind of, this is what we think um, is our beliefs. This is what we believe is important, those types of things. So because of many different reasons, uh, have felt led to spend time in this these, these few weeks. And um, I think it's been beneficial for some that are, that are young in the faith, whether, it's, whether that's an age or not. But if you're not used to or haven't been in church a whole lot or all those types of things, it's good to know what you believe. And it's good for everyone in this church to know what we say we believe. Because if we don't have common beliefs held together on the main things, then what are we doing? What are we doing here together? Um, so that's why we've been spending this time here. We started with the scriptures. Uh, Article 1, Article 2 is about God. Article 3 is man. Article 4 is salvation. Article 5 is God's purpose of grace. Article 4 and 5 are last week. And this week again, 6, 7, and 8. The church, the baptism, and the Lord's Supper, and the Lord's Day. So uh, if you would like to stand up one more time. I know some of you are going to go, Ugh! that's okay. You don't have to, but if you'd like to stand up, we're going to read these verses together, and then we'll dig into these articles together. This is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Then Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Father, I come to you, and I thank you for this opportunity to be together, and I echo Josh's prayer. God, I, I thank you for a space to meet together this morning on this rainy, cloudy, dreary day, God, that we are in the dry, that we may or may not be as cool or as warm as we want to be, Lord, but we are in the dry, and you have given us what we need to meet together today. God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy, and I pray, Lord, as we dig into your word, that your word would penetrate our hearts, that it would separate bone from marrow, that it would lay us bare before you, God, and that we would choose uh, in, in the agency of free will you've given us to continue to obey you and follow what you've put for us to do in our lives. God, we pray it all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. And all God's people took a seat. Amen. All right. So I'm going to read the, the first uh, article that we're going through today, the article six, the church. This is from the Baptist faith and message. It says this, this is what we say the church is. A New Testament church of the Lord Jesus Christ is an, an autonomous local congregation. I'm going to pause there just for a second. All that means is no governing agency tells any of our churches what they have to do. Each individual local church is in charge of each individual local church in the Baptist church. That's, if, you, if you have never ventured outside of that, you may not realize that many other denominations, they, they have a governing agency that tells them what they're supposed to do and when they're supposed to do it and how they're supposed to do it. And this is the preacher that you're getting and, and all those types of things. So it's very different than many other mainline denominations in that. Just wanted to make that point before we move on. So it's a local, an autonomous local congregation of baptized believers associated by covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the two ordinances of Christ, which we'll get to in a second, 
governed by his laws, exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word, and seeking to extend the gospel to the ends of the earth. Each congregation operates under the lordship of Christ. That is who is in charge. Through democratic processes. In such a congregation, each member is responsible and accountable to Christ as Lord. Its two scriptural offices, offices tongue tied this morning, are that of pastor, elder, overseer, that's one office, and deacon. While both men and women are gifted for service in the church, the office of pastor, elder, overseer is limited to men as qualified by scripture. The New Testament speaks also of the church as the body of Christ, which includes all of the redeemed of all the ages, believers from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Amen. Pretty succinct way to sum up the church. So, a few things we're going to try to answer this morning. Like, what is the church? What's its structure? Why do we assemble? And what do we do? And I think... I think our BFM says that, but we're going to look at some scriptures that go along with that uh, to explain what is the church, what is its structure, why do we assemble on a weekly basis, when we assemble for that matter, and what are we supposed to do. Uh, so the first thing, what is the church, we've talked about this before, but you may not know this, so here is a Greek word for you to take with you. Wayne loves it when I talk about Greek words. He makes fun of me as regularly as he can for this. That's okay. The word for church is ecclesia. We think of church in the modern day world as this place. But, but you know if you've read scripture that the church is God's ecclesia. Jesus' ecclesia, which is his assembled people. The church is the believers of Jesus. That's what the church is. Now, we come to a church building in order to assemble to not be out in the rain and all the elements and all of those types of things. And we're thankful for that. But the church building is not the church. The people in the church are the church. The assembled believers of Jesus. That's what that word means. The, the, the assembly, the, the congregation is another way that you could say that. So when people gather in Jesus' name, that is the church gathering up to be what it has called to be. Those that are called out is another way to say that word, to describe that word ecclesia. If you go to Acts 2, 41 and 42, it says this. This is when the church was literally being born. So those who accepted his message, pre Peter had just preached one of the best messages ever. Those who accepted his message were, one more time? Okay, so we don't make that up. His message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. 3,000 people Became believers in Jesus, got baptized, and joined the church. That's a heck of a message. That's one heck of a preaching message right there. Uh, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayer. So the church was born. The Holy Spirit was given. Messages were preached in all different languages to all these people that were gathered in Jerusalem. And the church was born right there. People said, I believe that. Now what? Well, if you believe that, then identify that you believe that. Get baptized. Okay, I'm baptized. Okay, now what? Now devote yourself to the teachings of the apostles, to gathering together, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread. We got that one down. And to prayer. This is the one that we're missing. In my estimation. I'm going to take a tangent just for a minute. All my life, I have grown up in a Baptist church, and I'm so thankful for that, because I do believe that our doctrine is right along with Scripture. I believe what we believe is what Scripture teaches, but I have always felt my entire life that there's something about prayer that we're not doing right, and I haven't been able to place my finger on it. I, 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 I just haven't quite known. And what I think is missing from our congregations is spirit-led, spirit-filled, spirit-manifested congregational prayer. The Lord's people being gathered together 
and calling out to his name together in prayer. What I believe we've done really well, and I mean really well, is private prayer. My whole life I've been taught how to pray, right? We had a prayer study in here 10 or 11 years ago. Changed my life, literally, radically changed my life. I don't know if you remember that, those of you who are part of that. It was phenomenal. We met in here on Sunday nights for like eight weeks. Brother Clayton led us through a prayer study. It was unbelievable. And the most powerful thing about what we learned in that was when we got together and prayed together. But still, even after that, and maybe you were better at this than me, but after that, I returned right back to most of my prayer life being a private thing that was expressed between me and the Lord because that's kind of how we lean in our personalities that generally gather together in a Baptist church. Prayer is such an intimate thing. It's so scary to share your heart in front of someone else to the Lord that I feel like we just back away from this and I believe it is why the Holy Spirit is missing most of the time when we gather together. Now, I'm not trying to be Debbie Downer or con con condemning us. I'm not. I'm not. Because I do believe there are times where that has happened. And I do believe there are times when it happens on the regular. But I have felt for a years and years in this church that we are on the verge, like right on the edge of something miraculous, something beyond just our regularly gathering together type stuff. It's, it's felt like it's right there. And I truly believe, and I'm moving on, I truly believe that when we get serious about praying together, not silently, out loud, with each other, as a church, I believe miracles are going to take place when that happens. And so, I feel led for that to start taking place on a regular basis. So go ahead and put this on your calendar. I had no plan of saying any of this this morning. Put this on your calendar. On March 31st, that'll be our first fifth Sunday of the year. And it will be a night of worship. But more than singing, it's going to be a night of prayer. And I'm praying, and we as a staff are praying, and are going to continue to pray, that this church is ready spiritually for that night. And that is a night that we stick a marker in the sand. We, we have an Ebenezer stone to remember that at this time, things changed miraculously that we can't explain. And I believe, I believe with everything in me that can and is going to happen if we will be obedient to the Spirit and begin to pray together the way the early church prayed together and not just on our own. Keep praying on your own. That's great. It's great. But the early church prayed together on the regular. There we go. <laughs> Moving right along. Uh, so that's what the church is. It is God's called out people that gather together and do these things. What is its structure? If you go to Colossians 1, 18, giving the, a long stretch of who Jesus is, one of the coolest passages in all of Scripture. This is just one verse out of that. He is also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. The structure of the church is simple. No man is in charge of the church. Jesus is in charge of the church. Jesus is the head of the church. Why wouldn't he be? Of course he is. He's the head of creation. He, it is all through him, by him, for him. So, of course, the church is for him as well. He is the head of the church. In that, he has given pastors, elder, elders, overseers. We usually say pastors in the Baptist church. 
there's three different words used in Scripture, if you didn't know that, describing the same, the same office of the church. So we have pastors and we have deacons that lead out as servants guiding the church, but the entire church is a body. It's a body where all members of the body all have a purpose, just like everything in your body physically has a purpose. And, and no one thing in your body is more important than the other. Without things that working together in your body, things go awry. We know that. Same thing in the church. When God has called you to be something in the church and you don't do that, it throws the body off. Every single person in the body of Christ has a purpose, has meaning, has value, regardless of what man tries to rank it as important. God doesn't rank it as important. He does not rank me standing here doing this as any more important than Sarah teaching three and four-year-olds Sunday school. Matter of fact, in my estimation, that's more important and harder what she does than what I do in here. So everybody has a, a place and, a, and, and something to do in the body. Jesus, pastors and deacons, everybody. But that's not a rank in value. That's a rank in role. Very different things. Uh, continuing in Ephesians 4, says this, And he personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the training of the saints in the work of ministry, to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son. Why do we assemble? I'll go preachery on you for a second. Give you four words that start with the letter P. We assemble to praise the Savior. One of the reasons we gather every Sunday is to spend time together exalting the name of God, lifting up the name of Jesus praising Jesus for who he is, for what he's done, and for what he's going to do. We also do it to prepare the saint. That's what this verse is specifically talking about. To prepare the saint, to teach, to admonish, to build up, to prepare the saint. We praise the Savior, we prepare the saint. We also do it to proclaim to the sinner. We meet every week with the hope that somehow, some way, God performs a miracle through His Spirit and guides someone to this church to hear the word of the Lord preached so that they come to the point of realizing they are a sinner in need of a Savior that wants to repent and place their faith in Jesus for everlasting life. Every Sunday we hope that happens. Every Sunday. And when it happens, it, we get to witness a miracle every single time. Praise the Savior, prepare the saint, proclaim the sinner, and provide for the sheep. That's, what we, that's why we gather, to do that, to do those things, to, to provide spiritually, materially, and every other way. If you look at the early church, they figured out a way to make sure those in need within the body got what they needed. And, and that happens so often in this church, it is mind-boggling, to be honest. And most of the time, Unless you're involved in it taking place, you don't even know it's happening because people do it all the time in this church and they don't want recognition for it and they don't want anybody to know why, who's doing it or why they're doing it. It happens all the time. I'm talking from buying someone to an appliance to dropping off an envelope full of cash, give this to so-and-so, the, the Lord is leading me to do this, like all the time that happens. And that's part of the reason why we are what we are, is to show that if we can help provide for each other, we're showing and mirroring how God provides for us. And it's a miracle, and it's amazing to be part of. So we, we get together to build up the body of Christ, to bring ourselves uh, unto maturity, to, to, to learn the ways, to go and make disciples. What's the next word? Of all nations. What's the next word? And then what's the next word after that? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then teaching them all the things that I've taught you. We have to meet together to learn what we're supposed to do. I don't know about you, but I hadn't got it all figured out yet. I, I still have not had a perfect 24-hour day. I, I mean, I haven't. I, not, matter of fact, not a perfect 24-hour day. How about not a perfect hour? I ain't even come close. 
I was, I was in such a bad mood one day last week. I was ramping and raving, and I was glad I was there by myself. And I got about 15 minutes into that, and I was worn out. And I was like, what am I doing? What is wrong with me this morning? Turns out I was just tired and hungry, um, <laughs> which is a dangerous place for me to be. All those that know me well know that. Yeah, I had a girl. Presley just amen that in case you didn't hear. <laughs> well deserved. 1 Timothy 3.15 says this, But if I should be delayed, Paul's saying, I'm trying to get to you, but if I should be delayed, I have written so that you know so you will know how people ought to act in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. <laughs> Isn't that cool? Paul literally says, I'm writing this letter to you. I hope I get to come see you soon. He probably didn't because he was in prison and was executed not too long after this. I hope I get to see you soon, but if I don't, this letter is so you can tell yourself and all those rowdy people how to behave. That's literally what it says. Teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. Right? How, to, how we ought to act in God's household. Now, that means different things to different people, doesn't it? And that's what makes it interesting. What it used to mean is wear the right clothes, take off your hat, sit quietly, and be respectable. Nothing wrong with any of those things. But it is more than that, right? I mean, that's not the most important things. And, and, I, and we've done a good job of trying to focus on the more important things. But at the same time, there ain't nothing wrong with a little bit of respect and decorum, is there? And not a bad thing. We could use a little bit of that in our society. A little bit more respect, a little bit more decorum, a little less casual nature about everything. goes a long ways. Just saying. <clears throat> so, what does it do? The church will finish there. Hold that thought. Okay? I do want to take just one second because uh, I don't want to not speak to things. So, last year at the annual meeting of the Southern Baptist Convention, there was a, an, an addendum made to the BFM. Okay? So, if we go to this next slide, you'll see the top paragraph is what this used to say, and then the bottom paragraph is what was added last year and will be re-voted on again this year because for something to be added uh, constitutionally to the SBC it has to be done at two annual meetings that way you don't rush and make a stupid decision or a foolish decision uh, in haste um, so this is what it says you can see there's not much difference but it's scriptural officers are pastors and deacons while both men and women are gifted for service in the church the office of pastors limited to men as qualified by scripture that's what it did say now it says it's two scriptural offices are that of pastor, elder, overseer, and deacon. While both men and women are gifted for service in the church, the office of pastor, elder, overseer is limited to men as qualified by Scripture. Now, I could go into all the two what, where's, why's, and from's, why that has become an issue, but the short and sweet of it is um, there are some churches who cooperate as Southern Baptist churches, one of them being the largest SBC church at the time, not in the SBC anymore, church in the nation that were um, ordaining and employing women in the role of pastor okay and what they were doing was what we would call a children's minister or a ladies minister but they were calling them pastors the role was no different than what we would do in this church but the name was pastor is it semantics a little bit. Do words matter? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. Um, do I believe that that is true? That the office of the overseer of the church, the elder of the church, the pastor of the church, has been ordained as a as a as a role for men only? I I do believe that's what Scripture says. I don't say that braggingly. I don't say that bodaciously. I don't say that with pride. I just think that's the way God set it up. Again, it doesn't mean anybody's more valuable than others. Matter of fact, and I've said this many a times, if it weren't for women, the church wouldn't have made it. It would not exist anymore if it weren't for women, the valuable roles that women play in the church. But that is what this church believes. That is what Southern Baptist churches believe. Um, and those churches that refused to stop doing that were asked to no longer be in friendly cooperation. 
uh, in the SBC. In, like I said, including the largest church in the denomination. Don't you think that didn't scare some people about the bottom line? What the Lord shall provide. Moving right along, enough of that. If you have questions about that, I'll be happy to, to answer that or give you my opinion. Uh, Article 7, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Christian baptism is the immersion, the putting of underwater of a believer in, wa in the water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It is an act of obedience symbolizing the believer's faith in a crucified, buried, and risen Savior, the believer's death to sin, the burial of the old life, and the resurrection to walk in the newness of life in Christ Jesus. It is a testimony to his faith in the final resurrection of the dead. Being a church ordinance, it is a prerequisite to the privileges of church membership and to the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a symbolic act of obedience whereby members of the church, through partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine, memorialize the death of the Redeemer and anticipate his second coming. The two ordinances or the two regular practices is another way to say that. The two regular practices of the church, the two like special ceremonies of the church are baptism and the Lord's Supper. We don't call it sacraments like some denominations do because the word sacrament is implying that this must be done in order to receive God's grace. Don't believe that. Don't believe that's what scripture teaches. I don't believe you get saved by being baptized. I believe if you are saved, you should express that through baptism. I believe that's what scripture teaches, and that is what our BFM teaches as well. Romans 6, 3 through 5 says, Or are you unaware that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Notice it says there that who of us? Most of us? All of us. That's an interesting word. All of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in a new way of life, which is why we say that when we baptize someone. Buried in his likeness, raised to walk in newness of life. It's an expression of what, symbolically, of what we believe takes place at the moment of faith. For if we have been joined in him with joined with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Whew, that's fun. Mm, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. I love, I love it. Love to see it. Uh, the verses we started at, Acts 41. So those who accepted his message were baptized. Okay? It's not to be saved. It's not what it is. It's not about salvation. It's about identification and unification. It's like this. <clears throat> Say you were, you, you moved, you were a high schooler and you moved in from another school, okay? And then you decided you wanted to go out for the football team, okay? And you said, man, I am proud to be part of this team. I believe in what Coach Crane is coaching us to do and teaching us to do. I, I, I am, I'm thankful to be part of these. I like my teammates. I trust my teammates. I want to be with my teammates, right? All the things. Little John forever, you know, all the things. Once a little John, always a little John. But when it came time to play the game, you still put on the uniform of the school you used to be at. To me, that's what not getting baptized is like. Now, could the person go out there and play the game? Sure. But it don't look right. It's weird. It's like saying, it's like saying I'm part of the team, but I don't want to do what it takes to look like I'm part of the team. To me, that's as simple an analogy as I can give for what baptism is. That's why it's a prerequisite to church membership. Because if you're not willing to do that, do you really want to be part of a church that says that this is an important thing to do? Put on the uniform. Show publicly that you believe what you say you believe. It doesn't save you. But it does matter. It does make a difference. Moving right along. <laughs> Acts 16, 30 through 33. He escorted them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. Because they will preach the message to them and they accepted it as well. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him along with everyone in his house. They continued to preach this message. There's more to this message than just those words. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Right away, he and all his family were 
baptized. But he didn't say be baptized to be saved. He said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. But I'm telling you, you'll never be at peace as a believer of Jesus until you first follow in obedience in the act of baptism. I believe that with all of my heart. So if you are here and part of this church, you've been coming to this church and you want to be part of this church, but you've never been baptized, I'm telling you it's an important step and it there's just something about it. That's why God told us to do it. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's the second ordinance of the church, the Lord's Supper. Does it have to be done the way we do it? No, it's not. We do it that way because we are Baptist and we like efficiency. And we do it as efficiently as we possibly can. Could the Lord's Supper be us gathering together as a potluck? And giving thanks when we break the bread and giving thanks when we take the drink? Yeah, could be. Matter of fact, I think that's more what the early church did, was had a meal and gave thanks for the breaking of the bread and for the drinking of the wine. That's what I think. But I think what we do on, on a regular Sunday morning, I don't think it's wrong. I think any time we take time to remember what Jesus has done for us, whether it be in our minds or with a symbolic act, I think that is a wise, good thing for us to do. But it's not like there's not a specific way you have to do it. I don't think Jesus is up there going, ah, that's not, that's not the way we did it. That one doesn't count. It's, it's about our heart, right? Last thing, the Lord's Day, Article 8. The first day of the week is the Lord's Day. It is a Christian institution for regular observance. It, it, it commemorates the resurrection of Christ from the dead and should include exercises of worship and spiritual devotion, both public and private. Activities on the Lord's Day should be, should be commensurate with the Christian's conscience under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, contrary to what many believe, there's not a whole lot of examples that say the church gathered and worshiped on Sunday in Scripture. It doesn't say that a lot. Acts 27, it says on the first day of the week they were gathered together breaking bread, and Paul began to preach. Uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 2 says on the first day of the week you should gather up a collection. Um, there's some other places that talk about the first day of the week or the Lord's Day. John says the Lord's Day in Revelation 1, but it's not like it's explicitly in Scripture. We always met on Sunday, and if you don't meet on Sunday, that's wrong. That's not what it says. But that is traditionally what the church has done since the church began, which was a major change for Jewish Christians, who Jewish people who became Christians who had always observed the Sabbath prior to that. Could we meet on Saturday night and have church and Jesus be fine with that? Yeah, we could. It would be fine. Could we meet on Tuesday morning? Yeah, we could. And it would be fine. Why do we meet on Sunday? Because Jesus resurrected on Sunday. That's why. And why wouldn't we meet on the day that reminds us of what Jesus has done for us? Because without the resurrection, there, this whole thing is kind of pointless. It's all kind of made up without that. So that's why, that's why we do meet on Sunday. But Matthew 12, 8 teaches that Jesus is Lord over the Sabbath. That, and, and that the Sabbath was made for man, not the man for Sabbath. So it's not about the day that you observe. It's about observing. But I do believe it's wise and good for us to meet on Sunday. Uh, but the, the point that Jesus always tried to make is that people matter over sacred days. The sacred day is not the important thing. People are the important thing. Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So that is why we meet uh, on Sundays. Romans 14, one person judges one day to be more important than another. Someone else judges every day to be the same. Let each one be fully convinced in his own mind. That's the part about the conscious part in the BFM. Whoever observes the day, observes it for the honor of the Lord. Whoever eats, eats for the Lord, since he gives thanks to God. And whoever does not eat, it is for the Lord that he does not eat. And he gives thanks to God. 
Jesus warned against legalism when he quoted Isaiah the prophet, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. God is not interested in our keeping of rituals, rules, or requirements. He wants hearts that are on fire with his love and grace on the Sabbath, on the Lord's Day, and on every other and any day in between those things. So, finish where we started, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. We say this every week, and we don't do it just for rote memorization. We do it because this is what we do. This is what we're supposed to do. We are supposed to advance the kingdom of God by going and making disciples. And by doing that, we bring heaven to earth. We bring the kingdom of God alive and well on the earth. We are God's assembled people, his church. Jesus is the head of the church. Pastors and deacons help guide, serve, and protect the church. We administer baptism and the Lord's Supper as the two ordinances of the church. Ultimately, every member that makes up the church matters. His role, her role, his voice, her voice, they all matter. We as a body submit to Christ's lordship over us. He is the head. We gather to, pr to praise the Savior, to prepare the saint, to proclaim to the sinner, and to provide for the sheep. Magnify God's name. Lift up our eyes and hearts towards heaven as a weekly reminder that we are just sojourners passing through a foreign land in this world. Every week, that's what we should be reminded of. This is a temporary thing that we're going through. Steward the time you've been given well. Steward it well. You're just a manager of a temporary vapor of a life that is continuing on for eternity. That's what we are here to remind ourselves of every week. Sojourners passing through a foreign land. We teach, we preach, we pray to prepare the saint, to train the saints for the work of the ministry, to build up the body of Christ, to make it mature, to maturity. To maturity of what? To maturity in love of Jesus and one another. And we don't do all that to stay in this holy huddle every Sunday. As we go about life, we go and make disciples. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always till this is over with and I come back. And then it's going to get really fun. So, that's the church. It's the institution God instituted in this world to change the world. Not a very big mission. Not very important. He, he only gave us the, the responsibility of changing the world in Jesus' name. Man, that's cool. I'll pray and we'll finish in this song. and um, We'll just finish up this time however the Lord leads. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for salvation, God. And God, thank you for the church. It's made up of messed up sinners like me and everyone else here, God, but thank you for it. I don't know how we could make it without the church. We frustrate each other. We disappoint each other. We lay each other down. But God, sometimes we show up for each other. And we help each other. And we love each other beyond what is normal in this world. And so I thank you that you gave us the church. And I pray that we would treat her well. That we, would be, that we would be gracious in our dealings with each other, in our roles as members of your body, that we would be serious about what you have called us to do, God, and that we would be thankful that we have other members in the body of Christ that can do things that we can't do, and that it all works together in your perfect, miraculous way to bring those who do not know you unto salvation, God, and to admonish teach, preach, build up those who do know you, God. I just thank you for the miracle that is the church and that we would never take for granted the wonderful, wonderful, gracious opportunity we get freely, legally, every week 
to meet together in your name, God. Thank you for that and for Jesus. We pray it in his name. Amen.